There aren't a lot of shows that have been on as long as and have generated as much discourse as The Simpsons. I mean, this show is probably older than a solid portion of the people watching. And since it's been a while since I've done an iceberg video, let's hop back into it with this cool Simpsons iceberg. This is a list created by Wilfred Cthulhu. I'll link his YouTube channel down below and is only meant to cover seasons one through eight because, well, again, this is a huge show. And also this is kind of around where a lot of people tend to agree that the show's decline begins. Maybe I'll do another iceberg video in the future covering some later seasons. If this video does well, who knows? And since I've done quite a few iceberg videos on the channel by this point, I'll keep the description of what exactly an iceberg video is pretty brief. I'm going to go through each point from top to bottom and discuss each of them. The top are more well-known theories or facts, and as you go further down into the dark unknown, things start to get a bit weirder and sometimes more abstract. And as always, there might be some spoilers ahead, but I mean, it's the Simpsons, like old school Simpsons. And hey, while we're here, comment down below what you'd like to hear me talk about next and make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. Graggle, Gumbly, Weird Matt. Graggle is a very real character who's been part of the Simpsons family from the very beginning. What do you mean you don't remember him? He's been there the entire time. Graggle obviously being a meta joke about the Mandela effect. Basically a situation in which a large mass of people believes that an event occurred when it didn't. He hasn't been part of the Simpsons, but the joke is pretending that he is. Graggle's origins go back to around 2015 on the Japanese text board community 2 channel. On that website he was originally known as Gumbly or kind of a small inside joke in a fairly niche community. But then, January 29th, 2021, a 4chan user made a post claiming that Grumbly was actually a Matt Groening insert character, saying, quote, Matt Groening had this insert character. He kept trying to shoehorn into the show. Believe it or not, this is how Matt Groening sees himself. He wanted to be good friends with Bart and replace Millhouse. The writers in the studios were concerned, going on to claim that the writers would refer to this character as Weird Matt. Then, the same day, January 29th, 2021, Simeon Jimmy shared on Twitter a photoshop of The Simpsons with Graggle saying, quote, Watched a new episode of The Simpsons for the first time in five years, and I guess they added this new character called Gumbly to the family? From here, the fire was lit. People began adding Graggle to older scenes, claiming he was always there, claiming that the crew was digitally adding him to older episodes and claiming how much the character had grown on them. Later in 2022, the Mandela Effect aspect of this was amplified by a Facebook user claiming they were surprised that this universe didn't have a graggle. The post blew up with nearly 2,000 shares, and it was just kind of this happening over and over again, with people every so often sharing out a Photoshop of an episode with graggle and complaining about him or something. Some Enchanted Evening Animation and Pilot the Simpsons famously, and for some reason, aired a Christmas special as its first episode. But there is actually a pretty major reason for this decision. Or a couple, I guess. First is obviously that the series was premiering like a week before Christmas. But more importantly, it's because the show's original pilot, Some Enchanted Evening, was apparently pretty terrible, both in terms of writing and animation. You can see part of this original pilot episode on YouTube, around 5 minutes of it at least, that's really all is around as far as I've been able to find. I'll link that down below. But it's kind of crazy seeing how different the animation was and where it would end up going. Most of the pilot episode would be retooled for a different season 1 episode, season 1 episode 13, also titled Some Enchanted Evening. 847.63 this is the number that flashes on the cash register in the Simpsons intro when Maggie is accidentally scanned while at the grocery store. This is actually a fairly quick visual gag. Matt Groening has confirmed that this is a reference to $847.63 being the average monthly cost of raising a child on the US in 1989, the year the series first aired. Butterfinger 
Butterfinger is one of the most iconic candy bars of all time, and in the late 80s, they made a promotional deal with The Simpsons that was hugely beneficial to both of them. They have produced an absolute ton of commercials for Butterfinger that almost always feature Bart. Nobody better lay a finger on my Butterfinger. In the beginning, the slogan he used was, Nobody better lay a finger on my Butterfinger. That would change a bit down the line. Strangely, in the Season 8 DVD extras, Graining revealed that Millhouse was originally conceived and created specifically to appear in the commercials alongside Bart, as these commercials began airing when the Tracy Ullman shorts were still airing before The Simpsons had its own TV series. Tracy Ullman The Tracy Ullman Show was a sketch comedy show that ran from 1987 to 1990. While the show itself is one of the greatest sketch comedy shows to ever exist, even winning 10 Emmys in its relatively short run, perhaps its greatest legacy comes from it helping to birth The Simpsons. The show would regularly air animated shorts. One of these was the infancy of the series that would become The Simpsons. You can see how the style was still much rougher than it would become and the voices weren't quite right yet. The first short airing on April 19th, 1987. The shorts were so popular that they ended up airing 48 shorts over the next few years, which is honestly a ton of animation put out as quickly as they were. With the final short airing May 14th, 1989, just seven months before the series would debut its official first episode, Simpsons Roasting on an Open Fire. Who Shot Mr. Burns Alt Outcomes who Shot Mr. Burns is one of the most iconic cliffhangers in all of media history. To simplify what happened as much as possible, Mr. Burns spends the whole episode basically pissing off the entire town. And at the end of the first episode of this two-parter, Mr. Burns is shot, as the title suggests. But who actually shot him was left as a mystery as this was the end of season 6. With the Season 7 premiere in Part 2 of Who Shot Mr. Burns not set to premiere for several months. This quickly became one of the most talked about mysteries ever. Who could it have been? Casinos were taking bets as to who the culprit was. Spoiler, Maggie had 70 to 1 odds. Let's go back in time and take that bet. That's the way to make quick money. Forget everything else you could bet on. But yes, it was ultimately Maggie who shot Mr. Burns. But to keep the secret from getting out, the cast and crew actually made, recorded, and animated several other versions of the reveal scene. Some of these were later shown in the Simpsons 138th episode special, where we were able to see different versions where Barney, Apu, Moe, and even Santa's little helper were all the gunmen. And there was even a fully animated version where it was revealed to be Smithers, for attempting to kill me, I'm giving you a 5% pay cut. Ow. Oh. Homer the Clown and Who Shot Mr. Burns In a similar vein to the previous entry, this is another one that focuses around the episode Who Shot Mr. Burns. But this time we're delving more into the theory territory. So, Homer and Krusty the Crown look incredibly similar. There's the whole thing where Homer was going to be revealed to be crusty if the series ended early, but that's not what we're talking about now. Instead, someone noticed that during the scene where the whole crowd was gathered around after Burns was shot, we see Krusty the Clown looking slightly off model. The shape of his mouth is different and there are no bags under his eyes. In fact, he almost looks exactly like Homer in Homie the Clown an episode where Homer did dress up as Krusty the Clown. The theory puts forward that Homer was dressed as Krusty to get away with actually shooting Mr. Burns, but Bill Oakley, one of the writers of the episode and later showrunner of the series, said that likely wasn't the case. What seems to have happened was the animators for the scene put Homer in the scene when he specifically wasn't supposed to be. And in an attempt to cover this up, they just kind of turned this version of Homer into Krusty the Clown. It's an easy enough cover-up, all things considered, especially since they were originally designed to look fairly similar on purpose. Homer and Krusty were originally the same. Once again, let's continue down this path. As just mentioned, Homer and Krusty were originally going to be one and the same, 
Bart would have no idea that he was generally dismissive of his father, to say the least, and would worship Krusty without ever realizing that they were the same person. In fact, Bart was originally going to find out in one of the shorts on The Tracy Ullman Show, but they ultimately decided against this, instead putting in a smash cut to Homer and Marge reacting, instead of showing Bart discovering the truth. And when the show was picked up and became its own series, they very quickly realized this would be an incredibly difficult bit to keep up, so they decided to keep them as two entirely separate characters. This, of course, allowed Krusty to become his own character, and to be honest, I think that was for the best. We were gifted with some amazing Krusty bits over the years that simply wouldn't have been possible if they were trying to keep up the idea that he was actually Homer. Fallout Boy Name Inspiration Fallout Boy is one of the biggest pop punk bands of the 2000s, and their name, of course, is actually a reference to The Simpsons, specifically the character Fallout Boy, sidekick to the superhero Radioactive Man. The band has actually been pretty open about this. Apparently, the band was having trouble trying to figure out what name they wanted to go with and were leaning towards something that was long and difficult to remember. When a fan at their show just yelled out the name Fallout Boy, which they were later referred to in the same show. And from there, it just kind of stuck. Though the character himself has only appeared in a handful of episodes, the band is obviously the more popular use of the name at this point. Even appearing later in the series, performing a cover of the Simpsons theme at the end of the episode Lisa, the Drama Queen. Marge's Bunny Ears When you look at the main cast of The Simpsons, i.e. the family, each of them has some stuff that helps them be unique and easily picked out. Marge, of course, has her tall blue hair. It's iconic. And apparently, it was used at one point to conceal Marge's huge rabbit-like ears. This is seen most clearly and obviously in the Simpsons arcade game, an older beat-em-up arcade game in the first Simpsons-based video game. In the game, when Marge is electrocuted, you see the bones in her ears or when her hair gets stuck in a vacuum, it gets sucked up and reveals her ears as well. Grading actually mentions in the Season 4 DVD commentary that he originally was planning on making Marge a character from his comic series Life in Hell, a series that very prominently features anthropomorphic rabbits. They've obviously gotten away from this, and have since shown Marge with her hair in styles that wouldn't work if she had huge ears hidden beneath her hair though this would have been an absolutely insane reveal to have shown to the masses. Michael Jackson working on material Everyone knows who Michael Jackson was. Love him or hate him, he's one of the most iconic musical talents of all time. And unsurprisingly, as someone who was alive in the 90s, Michael Jackson was a huge fan of The Simpsons. It's kind of easy to forget because the show has been out for several decades at this point, but Simpsons Mania was absolutely monstrous in the 90s. So for a show that's known for having an absolute ton of celebrity guests, it's not exactly surprising that Michael Jackson would make an appearance on the show. The episode was actually specifically written for Michael Jackson to co-star in. And while Michael Jackson agreed to do the episode after reading through the script, he did have a few stipulations. First, he wouldn't be singing. They'd have to get someone else to do that. It was kind of a joke Jackson wanted to play on his brother. Second, he wouldn't be credited on the episode. And that's how it went. Jackson recorded his lines, Kip Lennon recorded the vocals for the singing, and Jackson was referred to in the credits as John J. Smith. Apparently, at the time, people who were working on the show were actually not legally allowed to confirm whether it actually was or wasn't Michael Jackson. Do the Bartman. Continuing on talking about Michael Jackson, let's talk about the song Do the Bartman, a song that features Bart Simpson rapping that topped charts in Australia, the UK, and Ireland. And as my segue might suggest, this song was written and produced in part by Michael Jackson, though that wasn't known for sure at the time. There were rumors, but those were all vehemently denied. But The Simpsons was so big at the time that it actually didn't matter if Michael Jackson was involved or not. They had a hit on their hands, and they would capitalize with a music video directed by Brad Bird, who would go on to write and direct little-known indie darlings like The Incredibles and Ratatouille. 
Before the song was released, there were rumors swirling around that Michael Jackson was going to have some part of the album The Simpsons Sings the Blues, the album that houses the song Do the Bartman. But those rumors were quelled by stating that it was actually a Michael Jackson collaborator, Brian Lauren, who was helping with the single. This was kind of accepted until some years later, in 1999, when Groening finally confirmed Jackson's work on the song as a co-writer and producer. But he was unable to receive credit for the title because of his contract with Epic Records. Simpsons House Oddities 742 Evergreen Terrace is an address basically every fan of The Simpsons knows by heart. It's the address of the home The Simpsons live in. And while we've seen some rooms from the house time and time again, rooms like the living room with the couch, bedrooms, the kitchen, strangely, when you start really looking at the house and how it's set up, it starts making less and less sense. There's a really great video by The Real Gyms that delves much more into this. I'll link that video down in the description. But to quickly summarize some of it, think about how the house is set up. How do you get down to the basement? Where are each of the bedrooms upstairs? We've definitely seen some of these rooms have different orientations and be set up differently. It's kind of just all around inconsistent. But honestly, it makes sense that they'd get a little creative with how the house is set up and what rooms are in the house because, well, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how they got into a room or how it connects or how exactly the house is set up. It just matters that they're in whatever room is important for them to be in for the plot to progress. Oprah Interview In 1992, Oprah aired one of her behind-the-scene pieces of an episode. In this particular episode, she went to the Simpsons offices. While there, you can actually see Conan O'Brien in the background, as he was a writer on the show at the time, and she talks to Matt Groening, who encourages her to go to Springfield to talk to the Simpsons herself something that she actually takes him up on. In order to do this, we see an animated version of Oprah who shows up at the house of the Simpsons. She sits down with them, asks them a few questions, which kind of makes you wonder if she's ever actually watched the show. I mean, she's just asking, Lisa, what's it like being the middle child in this family? Riveting, and she gets her hair done by Marge. It's a really interesting piece of 90s media that doesn't exactly stand out as anything exceptional. It's just a bizarre glimpse into what was culturally relevant back in the early 90s. Selma's Earrings Selma is one of Marge's sisters, the other being Patty, and sometimes it can be a smidge difficult to tell these two apart. They are twins after all. But when she first appeared, Selma's earrings were a little different than they are now. And that honestly helped to differentiate between her and her twin sister more. Selma originally had these cool S earrings, but this was ultimately changed, likely to simplify her character design a bit more. Though to be honest, I kind of dig these original earrings. Kind of based wearing earrings with your first initial, to be honest. Marge's Dad Inconsistencies Marge's father is brought up so rarely that I'd actually be surprised if most people watching this video knew his name without having to look it up. It's Clancy, by the way. He's only really appeared in a handful of episodes, which is crazy to think about because this show has over 750 episodes. That's 75% of One Piece or 16% of Sesame Street. Though, to be fair, he is dead in the series, so he could really only be shown through flashbacks. And for this character to only be mentioned or even appear in a couple episodes, you'd think they'd take a bit more care in how they're showing him. But alas, even with him only showing up a few times, how he looks is fairly inconsistent. One time he has blue hair, the same as the rest of the family, and another time he has red hair. That's about it, it's just interesting that they couldn't seem to keep this specific character consistent. Bart Soul Buyer in Season 7, Episode 5, Bart sells his soul to Millhouse for $5. The whole episode revolves around him realizing that he does actually have a soul and that selling it was a mistake. But the problem is that Millhouse then sold Bart's soul before somehow ending up with Lisa, who returns Bart's soul. But the question has kind of always been, just 
how did she actually end up with Bart's soul? It's been something of a plot hole, actually. So, Bart's soul ends up with Comic Book Guy, who, when Bart stops in to get his soul back, reveals that he had sold the soul the previous night. This is apparently when Lisa would have bought it, but the timeline here just doesn't really make sense. So, the night before, the family goes to dinner, and Lisa mocks Bart for having sold his soul. Bart then spends the night outside the comic book shop, but when he wakes up there in the morning, comic book guy reveals he'd actually sold Bart's soul the previous night. Which, why is this guy actively dealing in souls? Even if it's just a paper, this is a grown man. Anyways, the timeline here just gets messy. Lisa would have had to have bought the soul before the family went to dinner, meaning she could have just given it to Bart, but decided to tease him instead. But then, why does comic book guy say he sold it last night and not just yesterday? It probably would have had to have been in the afternoon. To be fair, this episode's more focused around Bart learning a lesson instead of meticulously keeping track of the timeline of who owns Bart's soul at any one point and when they would have been selling said soul. Designed last second. Now, we've mentioned in this video already that The Simpsons originally started as a bunch of shorts on The Tracy Ullman Show. But this bit of the iceberg actually goes back a smidge further than even that. Let's talk about the pitch process for The Simpsons shorts for a second and what kind of led up to that. So before The Simpsons were a thing, Matt Groening was publishing a weekly comic strip called Life in Hell. Actually, it continued to run all the way through 2012. This is what was originally putting Groening on the map. And because of this weekly strip, Groening was asked to pitch to The Omen Show. But when he arrived, he suddenly had the realization that if Life in Hell was picked up, he would have to rescind the publication rights, something that he ultimately didn't want to do. The problem being that he was already in the lobby at the building he was going to be pitching in. So he did what any sane person would do. He quickly sketched up a dysfunctional family, gave them names based on his own family, and switched around the letters for the word brat into Bart. These sketches were obviously a bit rough because, again, he was rushing through them to have something, anything, to pitch. So he kind of assumed that the animators would clean up a lot of the designs in the shorts. They instead opted to just trace over what Grading had submitted, which accounts for the shorts' original look. Rusty Nails Rusty Nails is a reference to a real-life clown, James H. Allen. He was a clown who, according to his Wikipedia page, hosted various children's TV programs in Portland, Oregon from the 1950s to the 1970s. Coincidentally, right around that time, one Matt Groening was growing up in Portland. In fact, Groening apparently once made an appearance on one of these shows as a child. So when Groening was working on The Simpsons shorts and needed a clown-type figure, he drew on some inspiration from James H. Allen. That's right, this is the man that Krusty the Clown is loosely based on. Though, according to Groening, Krusty's more mean-spirited side is nothing like what Rusty Nails was actually like. Rusty Nails himself would also make an appearance as an interview in the Simpsons 20th Anniversary Special in 3D on Ice. Cancelled Spinoffs Slash Movies when a series is as popular and long-running as The Simpsons, spin-offs and movies seem like inevitabilities. So of course there were multiple pitches and ideas that almost actually happened. Let's go through them. First, there's Tales from Springfield, a series that would be based around the idea of 22 short films about Springfield, an episode that features people from Springfield going about their normal lives. The series would focus on random characters and would tell around three stories per episode. The cast was, and still is, fairly excited about this idea, but Groening realized that they just don't have the manpower at the time to add a whole extra show like this onto the docket. Next, there was the show Krusty, a show obviously about Krusty the Clown. He would move to LA and get his own talk show. There was supposed to be a bit where he was living in a home on stilts and beavers would regularly gnaw through the stilts. An entire pilot for the series was written, but it sort of fell by the wayside during contract negotiations and was left behind by graining. As for movies, there are three that we know of that never saw the light of day. First, there was Camp Krusty. 
a season four episode that they were originally considering making an entire feature film. But the crew was having trouble with filling the script out enough to cover the runtime of an entire movie. Graining also wanted to do a Simpsons parody of Fantasia called Simstasia. This was partially created but ultimately scrapped. And there was talk of doing a live action Troy McClure film, but this was ultimately shelved after the untimely death of Phil Hartman. Frank's Family Dr. Jonathan Frank is a recurring character in the series, and while we've seen him a ton of times, we've only seen his family very rarely. Did you know he was married and had a son? Well, he does. While his wife is only mentioned twice in the series before her first appearance, that appearance is also her only appearance in the series. Her son in the early series only made one minor appearance as well, crashing through a window while Dr. Frank is demonstrating remote controlled planes for babies. He does have some other family who shows up later in the series, including a non-canon mother-in-law who's just a Koopa Troopa, but we're not getting into that here. Prince episode. For all of the episodes of The Simpsons that we've been lucky to have over the years, it seems like a lot of time that it's the episodes that weren't made that tend to get the most articles written about them and hold the most discourse. In this case, it's the rumor of a Prince episode that never quite came into being. From the articles that have come out about the episode, it's said that this Prince episode would have been a sequel to Stark Raving Dad, the Michael Jackson episode. The episode was fully scripted at one point, and while who the official writer of the episode is remains unknown, it is confirmed that Conan O'Brien worked on the script for Final Touches. And while we've mentioned that Conan was a writer for The Simpsons, and he is obviously incredibly famous now for his run as a talk show host and just being generally hilarious, it's worth noting that he wrote and produced some of the absolute best episodes of The Simpsons. Marge vs. the Monorail for Christ's sake. So just knowing that this episode could have existed as a sequel to one of the best episodes when the show was arguably at its highest with some of the greatest writers and producers they had, it feels like such a crime that this episode just never came into being. Some portions of the script for this episode have been leaked online by former crew members, so you can kind of get an idea for what this episode might have looked like. Oscar Jacobson Take a look at this. It looks eerily similar to someone we've talked about quite a bit in this video, yeah? This is a comic strip created by one Oscar Jacobson. In America, this character is typically known as Silent Sam, and he debuted in 1920, almost 70 years before The Simpsons. Some people obviously believe that Groening's story of coming up with the designs and idea of The Simpsons in the lobby before pitching to The Tracy Ullman Show is mostly true but that he was so pressed for time he drew on his knowledge of a slightly more obscure, older character for the design of his everyman, Homer Simpson. The resemblances are definitely uncanny, but to me, this seems like a big coincidence. Silent Sam, while he was in the US, was much bigger in Sweden, and to pull a fairly random 70-year-old character that was never that popular in the US out as inspiration for your character design is an incredibly deep pull. But hey, maybe this can just be something that The Simpsons didn't do first. Dog and Barbershop Quartet Flashback In the season five episode, Homer's Barbershop Quartet, we get a flashback to eight years before the episode takes place, 1985. The Simpsons timeline is super messy. Floating timelines are a whole thing. But in this flashback, we see that Homer was part of a barbershop quartet that was nationally famous. And more importantly, we see a dog who looks suspiciously like Santa's little helper digging in the backyard. The problem obviously being that we see the Simpsons family adopt Santa's little helper in the series first episode. It was a Christmas episode, that's like the reason behind the name. So this is obviously just a continuity error within the show, or they had the exact same dog some years prior and just never mentioned it at any point. Jerry Design Change Jerry McElberry is the mother of twins Sherry and Terry, and this whole part of the iceberg is a reference to how Jerry originally looked when she appeared in, not The Simpsons of course, but rather one of those Butterfingers commercials we mentioned. 
She has a different hairstyle, face, and body. She was later changed to further reflect her daughter's character designs, which makes sense. She didn't really look like her daughters at all with her first design in the commercial. The lentil soup recipe is real. Lisa the Vegetarian is one of the most important Lisa episodes in the series. In the episode, Lisa becomes disillusioned with eating meat and decides to become a vegetarian, eventually leading Paul and Linda McCartney through a poo because, of course, they know him. While talking with Lisa, they mention that if you play Maybe I'm Amazed backwards that you'll find a really solid lentil soup recipe. That song, coincidentally, is played during the episode's end credits. And if you really listen, there's an extra voice in the background. And what that voice is saying doesn't seem to make sense. However, if you play the end credits backwards and listen again, you'll actually hear Paul McCartney giving his lentil soup recipe. The ingredients he's mentioned being two tablespoons vegetable oil, one medium onion, chopped, one cup carrots, chopped, two sticks of celery, chopped, one clove garlic, crushed, half a cup of lentils, one bay leaf, one tablespoon freshly chopped parsley, salt and freshly ground pepper to taste, two and a quarter cup vegetable stock or water. And while I haven't made this soup myself, the reviews I've read about it say that it does in fact rip. And funnily enough, he does also say, by the way, I'm alive, which is a reference to all of the Paul McCartney is dead theories that have swirled the internet since the before times. Mo knows it's Bart. Bart's prank phone calls on Mo are the things of legend. They've been a staple for the show since the beginning, but this theory puts forward that Mo actually knew that it was Bart the entire time calling and pranking him. I found a Reddit post that does a pretty solid write-up of some of the reasons behind this theory. I'll link that post down below, but in this video, I'll summarize and read some parts of it. First, they bring up that Bart's actual prank calls are pretty straightforward. And while most of the adults in Springfield aren't exactly intellectual juggernauts, this is a fairly low bar to get over. Not to mention that Mo even sort of plays into the names that Bart gives to make the jokes work sometimes. But even if Mo does know that it was Bart the whole time, the question comes down to why? There are a couple possibilities. First is that Mo is kind of a lonely person and that having someone call him fairly consistently might give him something small to look forward to, even if the jokes are at his expense. Second could be because he thinks Bart is kind of lonely, because his father spends a lot of time at Moe's. It's hard to tell and could be either or both options to be honest. Roy Simpson's Episodes Roy is a character who only very briefly shows up in an episode as a throwaway joke character. He shows up in Season 8 Episode 14, the Itchy and Scratchy and Poochie show. In the show, there's a joke about shows bringing on new characters to try and spice things up when ratings start to slip, and Roy kind of just enters the scenes, the joke is obvious. Apparently, behind the scenes, Fox was trying to pressure the series into adding new character, and this was sort of the show's way of making fun of that. But surprisingly, this isn't the only time that Roy has been seen in the series. He shows up a handful of times throughout the next few decades on the show's run, mainly just in the background or in a rogue opening here and there. Sherry Apparition This is a reference to one of the biggest animation errors in the history of The Simpsons. As we've already stated in this video, the animation in a lot of the early series, especially the first season, was rough to say the least. There's a lot of learning going on with the show, and as a result, some stuff fell through the cracks that probably wouldn't have a few years later. This particular animation error happens in Season 1, Episode 3, Homer's Odyssey. While Sherry and Terry are walking, for some reason, Sherry doesn't have a body. She's just a head floating by and talking with her sister. It's never acknowledged and is kind of weird to see once you're able to catch it. It gives off the vibe of a ghostly head a little, because it's just kind of discomforting to see. Less like the Waltons, more like the Simpsons. This is a play on the famous line from former President George H.W. Bush that he wanted American families to be a lot more like the Waltons and a lot less like the Simpsons. The Waltons being the titular family in the show The Waltons. The show revolved around the family living through the Great Depression and World War II with the idea of family being at the center of everything. Family. Family, family, family. 
the classic good night john boy becoming a popular line from the show good night john boy john boy damn it can't a guy masturbate in this house so when hw said that he wanted families to be more like the waltons he was implying a return to the traditional american lifestyle that he had grown up around less crass and in your face than the simpsons but the thing is, the American population had become less like the Waltons and more like the Simpsons in a lot of ways. I mean, the Simpsons itself was a mirror being held up to the American audience. For the first time in a long time, many people felt like they were being seen by a more mainstream show. That's a big part of why the Simpsons got as big as it did. It wasn't afraid to show what many American families were dealing with, warts and all. And this, for now, is where I'm going to be ending this video. There are a lot of entries still here on the bottom of the list, but after talking with the creator of the list himself, a lot of these points are just sort of him riffing, so to speak. He was just kind of having fun and coming up with some crackpot theories based on some stuff that doesn't have a lot of bearing or anything to really point to. Which is fine, it's his list, he can do whatever he wants. But anyways, this has been 10k Bill, and thanks for watching. Comment down below what you'd like to hear me talk about next. Follow me on Twitter to stay up to date on everything I'm working on. And of course, make sure you subscribe for all your entertainment-related content.